So we were just in um, the 1730s meeting Leonard Euler. And I should have mentioned, let me actually go back a slide or two. If you look at this painting of Leonard Euler, you might notice that he's squinting his right eye a little bit. He's a really fascinating individual. So he suffered from eye disease and he actually went blind first in the right eye and then later completely blind also in the left eye. And despite that, he still today um, is one of the most prolific mathematicians of, of all, in, all history in what he produced and what he published and the kind of mathematics that we use today that originated with Euler. So he's a really fascinating, amazing, and inspirational person with an incredibly positive attitude, uh, according to the literature. So anyway, let's leave him behind in the 1700s for now because his ideas weren't then used in genome assembly until actually pretty recently. Let's move forward in time to um, the 1850s um, and an Irish mathematician and his name was William Rowan Hamilton and he invented, um, he was like the father of modern optics. He did a lot of work in physics and um, what we now consider to be applied math. And one of the things he invented was something called the Icosian game, which relates to an area of math now called Icosian calculus. And um, the purpose of this game, and this was theoretical math um, that Hamilton invented, he was really interested in these, these shapes called dodecahedrons. And one is shown there. I took this image from Wikipedia, by the way. Um, and there, he, what, what, he, what the challenge of the Icosian game was, was to find a cycle that allowed you to visit each node, uh, which could also be called vertex, only once using each edge once. And so there is a Hamiltonian path drawn in red. I could start anywhere. So because it's a cycle, I'm sorry, I said path, but I meant cycle. Let's start here, right? And we could trace this around and we could get, and I'm kind of going to the back here, we could get back to our starting point. And it doesn't matter if I start there or I start, whoops, I start here um, or anywhere, you can get back to the place that you started traveling through each node only once. And you can do that in this dodecahedron. And that was the challenge in this game. Um, and if you do that, you will have created a path that is now referred to as a Hamiltonian path. And you might be thinking, what's the difference between that and an Eulerian path? And when we're looking at it just in this way, it is really hard to see, um, but they are somewhat different. And that difference is going to be clearer after we look at graphs called overlap graphs and how they can be used in two different ways in order to do de novo genome assembly. So that's, you know, an idea. This is a mathematical idea. This is part of graph theory. Um, and it was invented by William Rowan Hamilton back in the 1850s. And let's carry on with this a little bit. Okay, whoops, let me see. Okay, so let's look at these three figures for a moment. And I'm going to leave this with you for homework as well. And I'm going to ask you, can you find a Hamiltonian path or cycle or neither? And again, I'm going to tell you that one of these pictures is, a, is contains a Hamiltonian path, one contains a Hamiltonian cycle, and one contains neither. And I want you to identify which is which as homework. Okay, so let's like try to get back to that DNA stuff. Let's look at this DNA sequence analysis, okay? So I'm going to tell you that early genome assemblers, the first generation of them, relied on Hamiltonian paths to find um, sequences, like to connect sequences from reads together into contiguous fragments known as contigs or the larger structures, okay? And so here we have a circular genome, maybe this came from an E. coli, and it's, it's tiny, right? So this is just a, a made-up figure, but there are plenty of circular genomes. 
short read sequences might generate these fragments here, right? And if we stack these up by overlap, we can come up with a consensus. Sorry, didn't mean to tab through there. And in this approach, you could actually take those reads and you could place them on a graph, this image shown here, and each of these short reads could be a node, and each of those nodes can be visited once if you use this path. One, one to, uh, like this to this, to this, to this, to this, and then back to there. If it's a circular genome in a dream world, you get a cycle, right? If it's just a contig, you would have a path. But this is graph theory, looking for a, using an overlap graph approach and looking for a Hamiltonian path. All right, so leave that for just a sec because now I have to introduce you to an idea called Kamers. All right, so just bear with me here. This is a really important concept in sequence analysis. A Kamer is a substring of length k, okay? Mer in Greek means a part, all right? And you've heard the use of the word mer before. So, for example, primer, right? Short string of DNA or RNA used to start uh, synthesis. An oligomer might be like a short fragment of nucleotides of some unknown length, right? So here we've got kamer. These are little short pieces of DNA, all right? So, um, the number of kamers that you can have in any possible DNA sequence, right? Like maybe this one from the famous movie, right? So if we say, how many kamers could you have in Gattaca, right? So you can use a formula to compute that. So the formula is the number of kamers equals the length of the string minus k plus one, and you would specify K, all right? So Gattaca is seven nucleotides long, length equals seven, and let's just choose arbitrarily that we want K to be a three-mer, three nucleotides long, and then we can say, okay, the number of three-mers in Gattaca is the length minus the Kamer size, three, plus one, which equals five. And if we go through and we draw them, here's a kamer, here's a kamer, here's a kamer, and here's a kamer, right? There are exactly five kamers, here they are, in the word Gattaca. So kamers turn out to be incredibly useful in genome assembly and also for other purposes. They're something that um, computational pe computationally people are, have been and continue to be really interested in how kamers can be made more useful. So we use um, the kamer idea because even the short reads that we get from Illumina sequencing, they turn out to be long enough to be kind of complex and difficult to use in genome assembly. So this may seem counterintuitive, but we are going to take short reads and we're actually going to break them up into kamers, and this is going to help out with genome assembly as part of analysis, okay? And this dates back to some tech um, that you can look up called sequencing by hybridization that's related to the founding of the DNA array um, methodology, and I, I'm not going to get into that here, but I just want you to know what a kamer is and know that they play a role in genome assembly. Here's a picture showing you that rule. So a minute ago I showed you this approach, right, which really wasn't very different from where we started, you know, how we started talking about genome assembly, right? Here are the little short reads. Here they are all stacked up here. Now you could take these reads, which turn out to be surprisingly difficult to work with even at that size, and certainly at like the 100, 150, you know, 200, 250, and 300 base pair size that we commonly get from Illumina tech nowadays. You can take those reads and you can break them up into kamers. Okay, so you could go through each of these sequences, 
right, which are one, two, three, there's, they happen to be seven nucleotides long, so each of them would have five k-mers, right? You can, you can look at this list, and you can break out all of the possible k-mers, and what you'll see is that they're all here, all right? And then you can look for a Hamiltonian path. The k-mers are the nodes, right? And the lines are the edges, and the red lines are depicting the Hamiltonian path that hits each of these nodes you know, or kamers once, okay? And if you take those and you then stack them up, and notice that you continue to stack them up on the basis of alignment or overlap, and that is in fact how you determine where the arrows in the Hamiltonian path go, the authors of this figure have just laid it out like in a nice straightforward way for us so that the figure is not too messy, then you can get back to the original sequence. So the steps are take the short reads, bust them into kamers, make each kamer a node in an overlap graph, find the Hamiltonian path through, and you find that path by looking for areas of overlap. So TGG here, GGC here, the GG overlaps with the GG, right? The GG for this kamer is its suffix, its ending. The GG for this kamer is its prefix, its beginning. The suffix and the prefix overlap, therefore we can draw an edge between the two. Make sense? I hope so. That's the idea of taking, like finding the path using a Hamiltonian approach. This is actually a cycle, not a not a path, but that's okay. So you can do that. Um, it's certainly possible. And it worked a lot for the early genomes. It's in fact the approach that was used. So the first virus sequenced all the way up to the release of the first human genome in 2001. All of the assemblers were based on overlap graph consensus and you found the sequence using a Hamiltonian path approach. That's a, a generalization, but it's largely true. If you want to see what other genomes came out in this time fr frame um, and that would have been assembled using that approach, you can, you can take a look at the data here at this link. The problem, okay, and I'm going to tell you the problem in the next um, video part for this lecture.